Bibles to Romans chapter 2. We're going to continue there today, Lord willing, we're going to try to finish this. A biblical worldview, it's not uh, exactly happy preaching, you might say, but it is necessary, and we're going to uh, finish what the Lord has started here, a biblical worldview. This is part three. And if you haven't got the other parts, please go back and get them. This will make more sense to you. We need all the parts to make the whole. Please go back and listen to it. Lord, help me to speak with love and compassion this day. The Word of God says in verse 1, chapter 12 of Romans, I beseech, I urge, I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, logical, rational, spiritual worship. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that you might experience and know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. We've been talking about a worldview, and if you haven't been here, you say, what is a worldview? It is a system of beliefs, attitudes, and values that direct and shape our lives. It's like wearing a, pe a, a pair of glasses, and when you wear those glasses, you filter everything through those glasses. We look at the secular worldview, these glasses. It's about hedonism. It's about pleasure. You are the boss. You're in control. You decide who lives and dies. You decide your own moral standard of righteousness. You decide everything. Uh, the secular humanists have humanized God, brought him down to their level, and deified themselves to where they're their own God. They make up their own mind about everything. Everything's about pleasure. It's about success. It's about what they want to do. And so they wear and view everything in life through these glasses. But for us as Christians, we are commanded by the Word of God to filter everything that comes into our life through the Bible, through the Scriptures, through the revelation of God's Word. Now, I know that that is a difficult thing for us because we are constantly being pressured from the world to press us into its mold. But to overcome that and combat that, we are to do this. Everything in our life is to be filtered through the truth of God's Word. If you want the Lord's best for you, you've got to be wearing these glasses. Amen? Amen. And so that was a biblical worldview. A biblical worldview, I'm reviewing just a little bit here, proclaims a biblical mandate. First part of verse 2, that is not an option. Do not be conformed to this world. How clear could it be? So it proclaims a biblical mandate. This is the glasses that we are to wear. We are to filter everything through God's Word. A biblical worldview also prevents a perilous condition. Perilous condition. You say, what is that? Perilous condition. It is the believer who has an unrenewed mind and cannot discern the truth and the will of God in many things. Why? It's because of their carnal thinking. Listen, when we're saved, we are regenerated, got a brand new spirit, born again, got a brand new life, new creation, got a brand new position before God, but we still have a carnal mind. And that carnal mind and that carnal thinking is death to our spiritual life. Romans 8, 6 says that the carnal mind is enmity, hostility, rebellion against God. Your carnal mind will uh, reject the righteous standards of the law. Your carnal mind will reject the Word of God when it asks us to separate ourselves from things when we want to do those. Our flesh wants to do that. One of the struggle that many Christians have when they become a Christian and they're shiny and gets wore off of it is to deal with this carnal mind. That is why the instant anybody is saved in this church, they go into a discipleship program so that we can start that transforming and renewing of their mind. Amen? Amen? Amen. And it's something that we've got to stay after and after and after. And it, a biblical worldview prevents a perilous condition 
of a believer with an unrenewed mind who struggles with so many uh, things in their life. They just cannot seem to bring them to do it. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Amen. That's why we've got to stay in the Word, stay under the authority of the Word, and allow that Word to change us. All right. Last week, we finished up with a biblical worldview promotes a mental transformation. Verse 2 talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we looked at the key word. And that key word was transformed. It means to change into another form. And it denotes a change of condition. Being changed from that carnal thinking to the sanctified thinking. That's the same word that's used to speak of the transfiguration of Jesus. On that mount, Jesus allowed who he was on the inside to shine through to the outside. He did not allow his humanity to hide his divinity. And that is exactly what Paul is telling us as believers. We need to stop allowing the world around us to press us into its mold and stop allowing our humanity to hide who we really are on the inside as a redeemed child of God. Hallelujah. That's what he's saying. We have to stop that. And we have control of that. You do not have to be conformed. You can be transformed by the renewing of your mind if you are cooperating with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Amen? Amen. So that's where we left off last week. Today we're going to go ahead and jump in with what I call the specific process. There is a process here that we need to see. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Greek language is a very descriptive language, way more so than English language. You're reading an English translation this morning. How many of you got your Greek New Testament with you this morning and reading from? I didn't think so. Okay. When you translate the Greek, which is very descriptive, into English some, uh, in a word-for-word -word translation, sometimes there is not an adequate word in the English to bring out the fullness of what the Greek is trying to say. Such is the case with the word transform. And so I need to break that down for you a little bit deeper this morning. There is a specific process that goes with this transformation of the mind that the Spirit of God would have us to see. Transform is rendered in what's called the present tense. Literally, the Greek reads, continue to let yourselves be transformed. This transformation must not be a matter of impulse. On again and off again, it's got to continue. It's got to be something that goes on and on and on. Why? Because the pressure of the world is ever there trying to squeeze us into its mold. Always. You live in a sin-cursed world. You live in a place, I doubt very seriously, where most all people are Christians and they speak right and act right and all. The atmosphere around us is constantly trying to press us into its mold. And the Word of God says this transformation process is not something that just happens on Sunday. Not just something that happens on Wednesday. You need to be in the Word every day of your life so the Spirit of God can take the Word of God and transform your thinking and bring you in line with the truth. Hallelujah. Amen. You say that means a lot of time. Absolutely. Yes, that means you're going to have to cut that TV off so. That means you're going to have to get rid of those screens unless you're doing your Bible on your screen. Amen? Amen? That means you're going to have to spend some adequate time to feed yourself the truth so the Spirit of God can do its work in your life. Next, not only the present tense, but it's in the passive voice. Paul does not say, transform yourselves. The Greek literally reads, let yourself be transformed. The transformation is the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. You can't save yourself and you cannot transform your own mind. It is a work of the Holy Spirit of God in your life and my life. That means this is a serious work, people. Amen? You've got to let the Lord do that in your life. The third thing 
It's in the imperative move. As a believer, we are not to be completely passive like we do when we watch TV. <laughs> Got our remote and just, just uh-uh. Can't be completely passive. Our responsibility is to cooperate to the full, which means that you have to have time in the Word of God. You have to be focused. You have to be willing to hear what God is saying to you, and you have to be willing to let the Spirit of God renew your mind and your thinking. How many times have you read over something in Scripture that convicted you of something that you were doing, and what did you say? Did you just pass on and go on? You see, we have got to allow Him to change our thinking. Why is our thinking so important? Because as you think in your mind, your behavior will follow. Your thinking controls your behavior, whether you want to admit it or not. And if you don't believe something is wrong, and you don't believe something is inappropriate, it's not very likely you're not going to do it. You're going to do it. If the Spirit of God has half a chance with you, He will convict you and convince you and change your thinking and then your behavior will follow suit. That is why this is so important. And that is why I plead with you and I, I, I'm on you all the time exhorting you, be in the Word all the time. Amen. Be here every time that you can because you are getting an opportunity to be fed and nourished with an anointing that's on this word that goes to you to minister to you. Amen? Amen? And so there is a specific process that we must be involved in and we must cooperate with for the transformation to take place. Woo, this is good. Now we talked about some insects last week. The word in the Greek here is metamorpho. That's where we get our English word metamorphosis. We talked about the monarch caterpillar and the monarch butterfly. The monarch, in every monarch caterpillar, there is the potential to become a monarch butterfly. But they don't get that way just like that, do they? No, they have to go through a metamorphosis, a transformation. They spin themselves a cocoon and they get in there and some good stuff happens in there. And then what happens? They break out. And when they break out and they go through the process, they come out as a beautiful butterfly. Amen. Every single one of us that's born again by the Spirit of God have a caterpillar mind and caterpillar thinking. And that's got to be transformed by the Word of God and the Spirit of God so that we can have Butterfly thinking. Woo, can you get that? Yes, sir. Yes. Now, let me tell you something about that process. When they spin that cocoon and they get in there, and it's time for them to break out, do they struggle to break out? Yes. yes. Do they strain to get out? Does it take them a while? Yes. They struggle and they strain to try to get through that tiny little hole that's in there. They got these fat bodies that's full of fluid. Now they got wings. But there is no life in those wings. They're dead. And when they go through that struggle and that strain and that restriction, and it takes the fluid that's in the body of that insect and pushes it out into the veins on the wings and it gives them life. And it gives them energy. And without that struggle and without that strange strain, they can never become a beautiful butterfly that flies. If you go up there and try to help him and snip the end of that thing, he'll come out and he'll be just like this right here. Drag his wings around for the rest of his days. Honey, the transformation is necessary. That's why God says, allow yourself to be transformed by the renewing of your what? My. Man, I don't want to be no caterpillar no, sir. in my brain. I want to be a beautiful butterfly for the Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to bring Him glory. Yes, sir. There is nothing worse than a caterpillar who doesn't go through the process and he comes out on the other side, somebody's clipped it or somebody's helping get out and he's dragging a set of dead wings around. 
He looks like a butterfly, but he can't fly like one. Woo! Think about that. Yes, sir. Renewing of your mind. That word renewing, he says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's qualitatively new, defined in the word study. Therefore, a renewing or a renovation which makes a person different than in the past. Got to get rid of that stinking thinking. Got to get rid of that carnal thinking. Got to get rid of that caterpillar thinking, child of God. You've got to have that sanctified thinking. You've got to be in line with the truth. You've got to have that butterfly thinking so you can fly like a butterfly. Amen? Amen. Very interesting word here. Only used two times in the New Testament. Only two times. Once in this text and once in Titus 3, 5 says that not by righteousness which we have done, but by His mercy and His grace has He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And you can't save yourself. You know that. It takes the power of God drawing you. You say yes to the gospel and ask Jesus to come in your heart. Spirit of God will regenerate you. And neither can you change your mind, your thinking on your own. It takes a supernatural work of the Spirit of God to change your thinking in connection with the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, there's all kinds of things that need to be changed in our mind. The secular worldview sees sexual purity and commitment and living together in stewardship and entertainment and the way that we talk and marriage and abortion and pornography and celebration holidays and all of these kinds. The world sees this totally different than God's Word sees this. Would you agree? Yes, sir. That's it. That way for yes. That way for yes. We have got to give ourselves a chance here to stay in the Word and allow the Lord to change our thinking and transform our thinking about these issues. That is why this massive survey from 2017 said that there's only one in ten professing Christians that have a biblical worldview. No wonder the world is, uh, the church is living like the world. That's right. They've still got that old unrenewed mind. We've got to have a renewed mind, a transformed mind. Our thinking's got to be renovated. And I'm going to tell you what. Our conviction and our stinking thinking and our carnal thinking about many of these things, honey, they go down hard. Really hard. But the Lord's not trying to keep you from having fun. He's trying to save your life. He's trying to save your marriage. He's trying to save your family. He's trying to bless you. He wants you to be a beautiful butterfly bringing Him glory. And enjoy doing it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Woo, got all quiet in here. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Is that what you all are saying? Help me, Jesus. <laughs> and little people having a good time back there today. You hear that? <laughs> all right, next, the transformation result. <laughs> Listen to this. Be not transformed, or excuse me, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here it comes, the result. That ye may prove, that you may test what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mm. What is the glorious result? The glorious result is simply this, that the believer with a transformed mind will be able to know what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. They won't be having to wrestle and fight with God every time they turn around about what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. I don't have to fight with God on Sunday morning. I don't care who's having an anniversary. I don't care who's having a party. I don't care what's going on. I don't have any trouble with my flesh now since my mind has been transformed that my place is right here with the people of God on Sunday morning. Amen. You say, well, that's easy for you to say because you're the pastor. Yes, that's true. I'll give you that. <laughs> but honey, it's miserable trying to figure out your schedule. Where are you going to be? What are you going to be? Where are you going to do? Hey, I'm over that. I've had my mind transformed. Amen. Amen. Not trying to make you feel bad. Just trying to give you the truth here in love. The transformation result. Look at that word prove. It means to try, 
to test, to discern. It has the notion of proving a thing. Whether it be worthy to be received or not. It's worthy to be doing or not. Basically what Paul is telling us. That when you will prove this out. And if you will measure things and filter things. Through the truth of God's word. You will learn by experience. That that's not a good thing. Or that's a good thing. You'll learn it. You'll know. You, have, you won't have to wrestle around and carry on. And struggle with yourself. You know, folks, that's a wonderful result to be able to know in all these situations in life what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. Isn't that awesome? Jesus used this same word in a parable in Luke 14, 19. Parable of the Great Supper where he invited all of these people or a few of the people in the community to come and have a supper with him. And they said, oh, we need that supper ready. Let us know and we'll come. And so he did. He sent a messenger out and said, the supper is ready to come. And you know what they started doing? Making excuses saying they couldn't come. One said, I bought a piece of land. I cannot come. I've got to go see. <clears throat> the third one said, I married a wife and I cannot come. You understand that one, don't you? Married a wife and I can't come. The second man says, I... Bought five yoke of oxen, I believe he said. Five yoke of oxen, and I can't come. I've got to go prove them. Same word in the Greek text. What does that mean? Well, I've got to go out and hook them up to a plow. And I've got to plow with them. And find out by experience if I've made a good investment or not. He will learn by experience whether they're a good investment or a bad investment. And when you allow your mind to be transformed by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, filtering everything through His truth, you will know by experience what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Glory. Amen. Amen. This is not left up to chance. This is not left up to me to figure this out. This is left up to me to cooperate with the Spirit of God and the Word of God and let God do His work in me and reveal to me what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Praise God. Amen. Woo! Glory. Praise God. Do you get that part? That's good. Now, J.B. Phillips gives a little amplification to the last part of this. He says, so that you may prove, so that you may prove and practice that the plan of God for you is good and meets all of God's demands and moves toward the goal of true spiritual maturity. That's it. Honey, I put myself in a place of blessing when I figure out what God wants me to do and do it. God can bless me. He can favor me. He can protect me. Amen. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. But you've got to prove this stuff. All that list of stuff, you've got to work your way through out of carnal thinking into sanctified thinking and understand what God's position is on those things and then practice that and you'll see the blessing in it. That's what we've got to do. Now, <clears throat> Put your seatbelt on. We're going to do something a little different this morning, okay? We're going to prove an issue that a lot of people seem to struggle with and a lot of people are irritated with me because I have a different position than they have about Halloween, okay? Why don't we just take a few minutes and just prove it by the Word of God and filter Halloween and its symbols through the Word of God and so that we can see by experience what this is all about. Just make up your mind now. You're not going to get mad or be offended, okay? <laughs> Come on. I'm trying to teach you some truth here. All right, here's the symbols of Halloween on one side and the symbols of Christianity on the other side. Symbols of Halloween, you've got a witch. You've got a cat that's on the attack, arched back. You've got spooks and boogers. Graveyards, a big part of this uh, time. And jack o' lantern. Do you know what the uh, jack o' lantern is a symbol of? It's a symbol of a damned soul who's hung up between heaven and hell. That's what it's a symbol of. 
There is a foundation and an origin for all of this stuff. On the other side, you've got the cross, the sacrifice of Jesus. You've got the picture of Jesus there. You've got the Holy Scriptures. And you've got a little ichthus there, which is a symbol of early Christianity. One side of that is light. The other is darkness. Can you tell me what these symbols on the left have to do with the ones on the right? Can you tell me what spiritual darkness has anything to do with spiritual light? Just, just be honest about it. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and following through uh, chapter 7, verse 1. We need to read that whole thing. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What fellowship has light with darkness, it says? What fellowship has Christ with? With the ally or the devil. What? None. That text goes on to tell us to separate ourselves from these things. Do not be unequally yoked with these things like this. So a simple look at the, one, the symbols here. Uh, and the symbols of Christianity versus the symbols of Halloween. Halloween what, what difference does these things? They say, well, you know, I don't do all of that stuff. I do other things. Well... You can change the label on the bottle of poison and it just makes it more dangerous. Don't make it palatable and safer. It just makes it more dangerous. Just a simple look at the symbols. What do they speak of? All right? Here is the secular humanistic worldview of Halloween. A harmless event. I can't see with those. A harmless event when celebrated in moderation, neither good nor bad, but it's what you make out of it. Children and adults have fun. It's a distraction from the day-to-day -day life, a chance to party and be entertained. Retailers love it. It's good for economy. I understand all that. They sell all kinds of stuff. It's a time-honored tradition. That's the way the world sees that. It's just a bunch of kids having fun. But is that the truth? When it's viewed through the truth of Scripture. It's a very different look. A biblical worldview of Halloween, a harmful event because of its heathen, pagan, and satanic origins, practices, and symbols. Study it. Go to, go to Google and just Google the origins of Halloween. And you'll see it promotes fear, superstition, mischief, evil, spiritual darkness, etc., and is recognized as Satan's high holy day of worship. It's the day of the Lord of the dead, Sam Haman, which is the devil. Its symbols are jack-o'-lanterns, black cats with arched backs, witches, ghosts, goblins, skeletons, demons, etc. The things above are clearly forbidden and are to be avoided as revealed in Scripture. Honey, I didn't make this up, okay? Amen. I'm just a messenger trying to reveal truth. Here are numerous scriptures about this. Let's look at a few of them. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Wow. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those, and the word woe means judgment, to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sights. We need to be very careful about calling what the scripture calls evil and call it good. We need to be very careful about calling something that is spiritual darkness, calling it light. Ephesians 5, 8 and 11, through 11. For you were talking about uh, believers here when they were lost. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Amen. You think Halloween is 
fruitful works of light. It's not. It's unfruitful works of darkness. He says expose them. Don't Christianize it. Don't water it down. Don't try to make it something else. Call it what it is in love and try to encourage the truth to people and bless them with it. Amen? Amen. Amen? That's just two scriptures. Here's two more. Beware lest anyone cheat you or deceive you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. You think Jesus is behind, Christ is behind Halloween? <laughs> Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I cannot celebrate Halloween to the glory of God. Now, maybe you can, but I cannot. My mind has been transformed and renovated on this subject years ago. Listen, I've been there and done that. I know by experience both sides. Dawn and I did it with our uh, oldest son for several years until our mind was renovated on this subject and we understood we need to separate ourselves from it. Amen. You say, Pastor, don't you know that these people in churches all over the place is doing it? Hey, I ain't responsible for them, okay? I understand. I'm not responsible for what they do. I'm only responsible for myself and the people that I lead. Amen. And I'm trying to give you the truth as I understand it from the Word. You have, to, you have to work your way through this. I'm not asking you to do this because I do it. I'm asking you to do it because it's in the Word. Amen. And you work your way through this, okay? Thank you, Lord. Therefore, whatever you eat or drink or celebrate, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Listen to this one. Test. That word in the Greek text is the same one in... Romans 12, 2, prove or test. Same exact Greek word. Test, prove all things, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every <coughs> form of evil. Man, that's clear. Amen? Amen. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Do you really believe in your heart and in your mind that God is behind Halloween. Yes, sir. You believe in your heart and in your mind that Jesus is behind Halloween and he's down with it. He's cool with it. Yes, sir. Test the spirits and see what sort they are. There's somebody else behind that holiday. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you'll know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Know it by experience. Prove this out for yourself. Again, I'm not going to fall out with you if you don't see this the way that I see it, okay? I'm not going to break fellowship with you about this. I'm the messenger trying to bring you the truth about this so that you and the Lord can work through this and hopefully come to a different conclusion that you have now. Amen? Amen. Oh, boy, that's body weak. <laughs> you say, taking all that fun away from me. I, I, not my words. Not my words. Remember, little sin, little sin leaveth the whole lump. The primary reason why so many professing Christians do not act like Jesus is because they do not think like Jesus. The primary reason why so many professing Christians do not act like biblical Christians is because they do not think like biblical Christians. We need a biblical worldview. The word is extremely clear. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, so that you'll know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will be. Of God. God wants to favor you. He wants to bless you. We need to walk in truth. If you know the truth, the truth will what? Set you free. Set you free. Got a prayer for you this morning. I know this is hard for us. And again, man, I'm not trying to beat you up. not trying to beat you down. I'm just trying to bring the truth on this 
difficult subject to us so that we can live in victory. Amen. Here's a prayer. Direct my steps by your word. And let no iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man that I may keep your precepts. Say that with me, church. Direct my steps by your word. And let no iniquity have dominion over me. Redeem me from the oppression of man that I may keep your precepts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's bow before the Lord.